Hello, everybody. Welcome to MHTV. We're really pleased to have you with us today. And um, we're going to be talking about apprenticeships, but in a very kind of roundabout way, because we'll be following one of our colleagues' journey um, to becoming a mental health nurse. And it's a it's a really interesting one. So before we get started on that, um, and before we introduce our fantastic guests, uh, let's go to Vanessa so that she can show you how um, we can all join in and be part of the session. Vanessa? Thanks, Nikki. Looking forward to um, tonight's chat. And we're hoping if you're listening that you do join in. We like these conversations to be interactive. You can join in over on Twitter or X as it is now um, by just following the MHTV hashtag. Um, you should see the conversation pop up there. You know, do follow the thread, but also any questions, comments, you know, do feed them into tonight. If you prefer Facebook um, and you haven't joined in before, then go by go on to the unite mhna facebook page if you like the page there you should see the live stream which you can follow and um, i'll be keeping an eye on the comments box as well so similar to twitter x just um follow the conversation there add any comments questions and we'll feed them into the discussion tonight thank you over fantastic. to nikki fantastic so let's come to jane who some of you might might know from before i think jane mm. Hi everybody, it's nice to be uh, nice to be back again. Um, so I'm Jane Fisher, uh, mental health nurse lecturer um, at um, UCLan um, in Preston, um, and a big part of my job as a mental health nurse lecturer is supporting the apprenticeship um, students. Um, so I'm personal tutor and heavily involved in the mental health apprenticeship um, students. Um, so some we have on a four year program um, and other apprenticeships we have um, on a um, on a two year program. Um, and I know we're going to talk about it lots, but I genuinely think it's an amazing route into nursing, uh, specifically into into mental health nursing. Um, it widens that uh, that opportunity up for people. Um, I did my nurse training when I was young I had no responsibilities I had no mortgage I had no house I had no children mm. um you know I, I was able to to do it then um the thought of you know be having to do it now you know with with children house mortgage um you know and but the apprenticeship route really opens it up um to people um like Stephen and, and many others like Stephen mm. who otherwise would not be able um to come into mental health nursing um, and it's just an absolute joy to see them journey along the program um, and and turn into absolutely fantastic, compassionate, skilled uh, mental health nurses. Um, and I genuinely feel that the mental health nurse profession would be um, would be um, quite quite limited and and would um, would be a, a loss if we didn't have the apprenticeship route um, into nursing. Mm -hmm. So I'm a huge advocate for the um, for the apprenticeship route into nursing. Definitely, definitely, which brings us very nicely to Stephen. Stephen, could you introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about your story? Uh, yeah, uh, my name's Stephen Jewell. I am a newly qualified uh, mental health nurse. Uh, Congratulations. And for r &A for a couple of years while I did uh, the second apprenticeship uh, R&A programme with Jane. So Jane is responsible for me. Thanks, Jane. Um, mm. Well, yeah, it's not always been. I've never. I'm at a stage in my life now where I'm completely content. I'm settled. I found a job that I truly love, but mm. that hasn't always been the case. Uh, quite a traumatic childhood uh, growing mm. up. A lot of neglect. Uh, a lot of abuse. Never thought I'd amount to much. I was bullied at school. Ended up leaving school at 14 uh, mm. to, to just get away from the abuse. Uh, got kicked out of my mum's house not my home mm -hmm. uh, at Christmas when I was uh, 15 so I went to live with my dad and I just found just jobs that I didn't particularly enjoy uh, I went to work at a warehouse working nights did that for about 12 years until I was 20 26 27 mm. absolutely hated every single hour that I worked there uh, mm. Caused me mental illness, started suffering with depression and anxiety. I think because I was working on my own at night time, no one to talk to. Uh, I had no social circle, so I had a bit of school. So I think 
you sort of pick your friends up when you're at school, per se, mm. and they sort of follow you into adulthood, or some do anyway. And I think not having that, I think I, think I lacked people skills and being able to make new friends because I've not learned that skill. Mm. I think school was just all about surviving, like and getting through a day mm. without getting beat up. Uh, and they wanted to be better at home. Either. There was no sort of respite to escape at home. Mm. Could also have left you in a really sort of difficult position then. So, how did you come from to, to move from that space to the next stage of your life? What happened then? Uh, it was just so I saw a mental health professional. Uh, I was having uh, a non epileptic attack disorder, and it was a uh, counseling. And, basically ascertained that it was a direct impact of my childhood of the abuse. I must have yeah. repressed it somehow. Yeah. And uh, one of the abusers was always a bit in the paper, and that's when I started having these non-epileptic attack uh, disorder. Yeah. Uh, so I must have, like, repressed it. Uh, I'm re- I was really good at that when I was younger, just, like, hiding things. And it was only mm-hmm. when I got to that stage in my life, I saw the obituary, and I was like, it mm-hmm. just, yeah, it just hit me. I started having seizures. I generally thought I was going mad because mm. it took a long time. It took uh, probably about two or three years to try to find out what it was. Uh, mm. There was no epilepsy. I was having EEGs. I went to the Walton mm. York Centre as an inpatient for a while. I was having battery tests and and then they were like blaming it. Oh, it's just like behaviour. He's mm. playing up sort of thing, mm. uh, which is quite difficult to hear. But it was only when I had therapy that... Mm. He actually got that diagnosis and not like that sort of, and that was solely due to the abuse I'd suffered. Mm. Uh, and I think just it was the first time in my life I'd ever spoke about it. I was yeah. talking about that 30 years old then, and just mm. to have someone, someone sit in front of me and actually listen to me, not judge me, not say that I'm you know pulling a leg, these seizures are not real, mm. to actually understand that trauma can cause this and just to get to the root of the trauma. and. You know, I'll never forget that experience of being sat in that office, having that person listen and talk to me. And I think it was then I thought I could do this. I could, I could be that person who someone can unburden themselves to, someone can talk themselves to. Mm. But again, I no GC. I can't amount much, so I just ended up flitting from job to job. I worked for takeaways, I worked for coffee shops. Mm. Uh, and then I got to the stage where I set up uh, my own business, writing sports reviews. Mm. Uh, really enjoyed that. I had like a loyal following. Uh, it paid really well. So I opened a little fruit and veg shop. Mm. Uh, named it <laughs> Jeff's Fruits and Veg. Uh, when it got <laughs> Jeff at school. So I thought, uh, and I absolutely adored it. And I did a lot of home deliveries. Veg uh, mm. is heavy. So uh, not a lot of customers were elderly. People mm. who couldn't get out and perhaps carry sacks of potatoes and carrots mm. and that. So they used to do with like single person veg packs for the elderly and they used to deliver them when the shops were shut. Mm. And it was that time that I thought, ah, I can actually engage well with people. Yeah. So I just sat with these ladies, like these mm. elderly ladies and elderly gents, they'd offer me a cup of tea and then I'd drop the veg off and then I'd just sit and have a brew them for 10, 15 minutes. Mm. We were very isolated and lonely. And to some extent, so was I, because I didn't mm. have that social network or them friends to mm. go to sit mm. and have an adult conversation with someone and just, I think it was company for all of us. Mm. So I had quite a regular uh, customer sort of thing you delivered. I don't even think some of the times they wanted the veg. I think they just wanted me to come round for a brew and uh, mm. well, I enjoyed it. You know, it's, mm. uh, and it was out there, I thought. I can actually do this. Mm. My wife, uh, I've met my wife when I was, sorry, my anniversary on my... Uh, yeah, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Just think sorry, of a number. <laughs> sorry, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I've been with my wife about 13 years uh, and she has always wanted to be a nurse. So I have a little baby. She came out with hip dysplasia, so she was in hospital for long periods of child, so she always wanted to be general nursing. Uh, but she could never... She was working, she started work when she left school. So I think mm. when you start getting that salary, it becomes really difficult to step yeah. away from having Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And yeah. you're nights out, you're going on trips, your car insurance. And it's like, I have to give all this up because I've got university. Because my mm. wife didn't have children, well, my girlfriend at the time didn't have children. So she was mm. a single person. Uh, it's very difficult to go to university and giving up that salary. 
So I made this a thing and I said, just quit your job. I'll support us while you go through university to like sort of achieve what you want to achieve. I said, then I'll go after you. Uh, so she did. She qualified. She had to do a year access course. She had, again, she was like me. She had either poor or no GCSEs. Yeah. Okay, GCSE spelled dud. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, she did it. She achieved it. She became a staff nurse and just seeing the happiness on her face for seeing something that she'd achieved. Mm. And that's something that perhaps I've never had. I've never had any ambition. I've never had mm. a stage where I could be like, I really want to be this when I'm older. Mm. Uh, and I wasn't stupid. I was quite intelligent at school. Uh, I used to hide in the library at lunchtime uh, so I didn't get bullied. Mm. And mm. I remember the librarian, Miss Usherwood. She made me like a librarian assistant. Then it kept me in at break time. But it was ace because I could just read in there. I could sort of increase my own knowledge. Mm. But then I so left without any. So anyway, sorry I'm rambling there. But no, yeah. in a weird way, yeah. you're describing exactly the kind of skills that you need to accrue yeah. to be a really good mental mm. health nurse. I mean, if you wrote a list yeah. of things that you'd want somebody to understand, they understand the impact yeah. of trauma on people, on isolation on people, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and things about like learning how to communicate with loads of people from different backgrounds, you know, all the different yeah. things you're talking about are jobs that really skill somebody up. And I think, you know, as Jane's saying, it's a tragedy that, you know, before nurse apprenticeships gave their option, all the skills that you have and all the skills that your wife had could have been lost to nursing. That's, it doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Because life experience and the experience of actual practical compassion in action is so important that what somebody did when they were 15 doesn't seem to be the most important thing when someone's 30. Yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I agree with you. And that's it. It's that one exam, isn't it? It's that VCSE. And I'm all for, you know, we've got three functional skills now to get to university, which I, I really am mm. a massive believer in that because there is people like myself with left school. They mm. haven't got that GCC certificate. Uh, so being able to give the opportunity to have a short college course, a lot of it's funded by the local council as well, these functional yeah. skills, to give people that skills to actually be able to then go on to an access course. Mm. So indeed, my wife was a, she worked in a care home, kid with dementia for mm. most of her life before nursing. Mm. And she did night school to do her GCSEs or to get onto the mm. access course, then to get yeah. onto the nursing. I think should... access courses are really tough as well. Yeah, yeah the, because struggled. the exams and assessments come so thick and fast. You have to yeah. be really organised. Yeah, she really struggled with that, especially holding down a full time job as well mm-hmm. at the time. And yeah, the people don't it, take, take into account things like nights and shift work, the impact that has on you yeah. and your ability to concentrate. I think you do a ten hour shift and then you're going straight to night school to mm. you know, write you know, like literature reviews and things, uh, mm-hmm. and social care access mm-hmm. course. We did really well. Uh, it was long for her, she didn't drive at the time, so we had to put the board car. So uh, she used to have to get the bus up to college, which was probably about 45 minutes each way. Mm. Uh, the real dedication, yeah. isn't it? So it let's is. take it to us. So you, at this point now in, the, in your in your narrative, you, you were working on fruit and veg. How do you come from fruit and veg to the next stage? <laughs> uh, I think just, I quit, I quit. I basically, I thought, I can't do this anymore. I'm not happy. I was deeply unhappy. Uh, even though I had sort of that social circle with my elderly yeah. elderly people, I thought I want more. I want more for life. And a lot of it was my daughter. I wanted to make my daughter proud because I've got a uh, she's twenty two now. Twenty one, so she's twenty this year. Uh so absolutely yeah. love it to this, but I've never been never been able to provide for her as much as I wanted to, like either yeah. emotionally, because of my uh, I thought I was broken to be fair, because I couldn't love, I couldn't and I just wanted to be proud of me. I wanted her to look at me and say, that's my dad, and mm. have that proudness. And so I thought, I want to change her. I want to give her the best possible life that I can. I used to take her on holiday uh, abroad and that, but actually I wanted her to to see me as a role model, yeah. for someone to look up to. I didn't want to see me deeply unhappy mm. with me through bed shop. I used to have her as a Saturday girl working for me. She didn't do any work. She just ate my profits. Awesome but, way. <laughs> yeah. At least she's to, getting food and veg. Look on the bright side. Yeah, the doing a good uh, job. Yeah, I think she's watching this, but she has to wages as well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I thought I just need to do something new. So uh, I ended up moving out of the town that I was born in. I think that held a lot of negative memories for me. So yeah. to get out of that town, it was like a fresh start for me. It was closer to my wife's work as well. Uh, and I applied for a job at a mental health hospital. Uh, I had no idea what it was. I'd never been in one before. I'd never 
it was a clear, it was, the hospital was across from where I lived, and I used to see it as I walked the dog's path every day. Never knew what was inside, what went on, so I thought, I'm going to try it. Uh, got there, got the interview, which was very surprising. I had no prior experience. Uh, went went for my interview, and it was a group interview. Uh, so I was like, oh, no. And I was nervous, understandably. There was a lot of people there in uniforms who mm. obviously worked there on the bank uh, and were going for a full-time position. Mm. And I'm just like, what am I doing here? Like, completely, like, no idea. Mm. Uh, but it was really good because I always say, it's like, think before we speak and only say something if it's worth saying. Mm. There was a lot of people in the interview who were perhaps just talking like like I am now, just with nothing no. really purpose. But yeah. actually... I did really well in that because I was answering concisely and mm. uh, thinking of my answers. Mm. So I got through to the next stage, which was a one-to-one interview. So, and yeah, I got a phone call to say, congratulations, you got a job. Uh, yeah. You want to pick you, the intensive care bit. I was like, mm. oh, I thought intensive care. And I had no idea prior to starting. I didn't <laughs> mm. That's didn't how they book. get you, Stephen. Yeah. It is. That's how we all started. <laughs> I my induction. I was like, pick you. And I was telling the wife, I was like, mm. they're all going to be like intensive care. They're all going to be on like life support machines because that's why I associate as an intensive care. Yeah, unit. yeah, yeah. Uh, so my wife's like, I don't think, no, no, they will. I said, they will be. It's like, they're going to be on intensive. And I was like, oh, okay. And then when I walked in, I was like, oh, they're not. Yeah. And when I was having my walk about, uh, this like a uh, patient jumped out of me and went boo she must have seen I was scared and I absolutely I was like oh no no it's not for me my heart was pumping it absolutely terrified me but then he started laughing so I was like I, I, li- I like this guy he's yeah. seen that I'm scared he's made me scared but he's actually yeah he's yeah. good and I just absolutely looked after my age. I loved it everything about um, doing physical ops uh, on the picky there's a lot of time sat around talking to patients as well yeah. playing board games mm. uh Engaging Amazing. with them and actually yeah. people, people are talking to me. I'm getting paid to sit on a sofa next mm-hmm. to a patient and talk to them and find out the life story and make them a cup of tea and play Scrabble with them. And it's like, this is absolutely amazing. Like, where mm-hmm. has this been all my life? And mm-hmm. just being upskilled as well. So they're teaching me how to do physical observations because we've all had them done when we've been in hospital before. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's like, what magic is this? You know, they're putting this cup on. What are they doing? Mm. Uh, and to be trained to do that and just everything, like safeguarding. And mm. I was just lapping it all up and I'm thinking, this is free education. They're teaching me about safeguarding. They're teaching me about the mental health acts and sexual mm. safety and leave. And that's as a support worker. And I'm like, this is great. It, I'm getting all this training. Uh, and I, I started becoming more confident, more competent. Because uh, I've gone from being this really quiet, shy, a nervous person with no friends to actually like mm. likable people were mm. inviting me out for a drink people were inviting me to play football with and I'm like this is like so not only did my professional career uh, progress but also mm. you know again friends yeah. Uh, yeah I think that's really important for anyone in life just to have that one person because you know you're in mood you've got someone to reach to whereas in mm. the past I've only perhaps had my wife you know mm. to speak to my daughter Mm. And very isolated, but then getting onto this mental health world, it's like, oh, I've got friends, I'm, I absolutely love my job. You know, mm. like, I used to hear people like, oh, I can't bother. And I'm like, oh, it's brilliant. You know, it's like, skip to work in the morning. Yeah. Uh, and I was very, very enthusiastic. So one of our matrons uh, mentioned the TNA course, mm-hmm. which was a trainee nursing associate. So it's a uh, stand for when you qualify. It's a two year course. You have loads of little placements. Uh, and then you get your NMC registration. Uh, would you like to apply for it? I think you'd be good at it. I was like, wow, someone thinks I'll be good at something. So, of course, I'm going to do it because I've been told all my life that I'm never going to amount to something. And then this, like, matron. And like God figures, aren't they? You just sort of, especially when you're just like, a, you know, you're starting first thing mm-hmm. at a chest, you see a matron, like, wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, then they are human. They're not, they're not super human. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, yeah, if she thinks that I'm going to go for it, I'm going to go for it. So I did, I applied for it. Uh, and I got it. I was like, hang on. I'm like, this greengrocer has managed to get on the apprenticeship mm. to go to university. What's going on? Uh, didn't think I'd be able to do it. I'm not going to lie. Like, first day of uni, it was like first day of school. You're mm. trying to look about and try and find 
people who you're going to spend the next two years with. Uh, I was looking about, it's like, well, they're already in a group, they're already in a group. And then I found two girls uh, who had seen about the workplace as support workers myself. Uh, so I just sort of latched on to them. And uh, I think Jane's had us for the past. How long did Jane? Two years. Yeah, so the so the TNA, so that's the Training Nurse Associate Program. Mm. Um, so that um, that enables people to become um, a band four. Mm-hmm. Um, so support worker is generally a band three. Yeah. Um, um, nurse associate is the band four, and then registered mental health nurses is, is band five. Mm. Um, so the the Training Nurse Associates were were brought in. Um, initially to try and bridge the gap between um, support workers and the registered nurses um, to try and fill some kind of recruitment issues um, around um, around around nursing. So it's relatively relatively a new um, a new role. Um, again, it's done through the apprenticeship route. Um, so so learners are um, learners are funded by their 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 employer by their trust um, mm. to come on um, to come on to that um, come on to that course mm. um, and then that's a two year program and they qualify as a um, as a band four mm. um, nurse um, associate mm. um, not field specific um, so nurse associates can work in adult um, child uh, learning disabilities or um, or mental health mm. um, lots again lots of value lots of you know advantages of that band four role um you know I'm, I'm particularly interested in you know and in, in looking at kind of you know that transition from a band four to a band five um reg- uh, to to a registered mental health nurse because mm. uh, I think there's some kind of value in in looking at that um so Stephen um and lots of others have done the um done the band four um registered nurse associate program for two years um some like Stephen then um immediately after got onto the um rnda which is the registered nurse degree apprenticeship um mm-hmm. program um others in stephen and other another cohorts maybe uh, worked as a band four for a couple of years um before mm-hmm. coming onto the um mm-hmm. rnda um to become a a, a registered um mental health nurse Mm. And I think there's lots of things we can sort of talk about, particularly I think having Stephen who's really helpful about the experience of apprenticeships. But before we do that, and Vanessa, I, I can see um, Dave's been saying some questions have been coming in. Are you I'm busy typing. I'm busy typing away, so I haven't had a chance to look questions? at Dave's questions. But I look now. I'm, I've got them now. Right. Yeah, I was tweeting away, and I, w- I was listening, and I was thinking that. Bizarrely, when I was a teenager leading up until I went into mental health nursing and I grew up in a northern town, um, I worked at a green grocer's too, that's why I did. And I absolutely loved it. Um, and um, because it was it was right in the center of the town, it was in a seaside town where I grew up. And um, all the characters from the local area used to come in and kind of got to know everyone. So I was listening to listening to that with a smile, thinking back. To, yeah. um, to my time yeah. as well, weirdly. <laughs> Mine were seaside time. Mine were in Fleetwood. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. you'll understand the, the yeah, sort of do, culture, yeah. similar culture. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right then. So questions. Um, so Dave, um, Dave's put some of the questions that are coming in. The first one is, um, what level are apprentices educated to? So I guess that's one for Jane. How does this differ from a more traditional entry route into registered nursing? And how does it differ from the nursing associate route? Um, well, I guess you've kind of answered that a little bit just now, haven't you, really? Yeah, yeah. So the nurse associate is the band four, um, where students come in under the um, apprenticeship programme um, and do a two-year programme um, to become a nurse and associate, which is uh, non-field specific. Um, and then if, if learners want to, um, they can then um, enrol onto the RNDA, which is the Registered Nurse Degree Apprenticeship, and then they um, specialise in a field. So they'll either become a registered mental health nurse um, or an adult nurse or, L- or LD nurse. Yeah, great. Thank you. And then um, we've got one for Stephen here. It says, um, Stephen, could you have imagined anything that could have accelerated your entry into nursing or did it all happen at the right time for you? So, um, yeah. 
Uh, I think having people believe in you can help accelerate yeah. anything. And I think it's just taking again. It, I had nothing else to lose in my, you know, that's that's what I felt. Uh, mm. I was deeply unhappy. And if you believe you can do something, if you're passionate about something, then especially because I love my sport work for job. Mm. But then I thought, I've got these skills and someone believes in me. They said I can do it. They think I can do it. I think I can do it. I'm going to yeah. go for it. And it's just, I think it's having that belief in yourself because people can knock us down all through our lives. But it's about our mm. like, internal ability to say, I'm not having that. I know I'm good enough. I know that I can do this. And mm. just have mm. it. And you can as well. It's believing in yourself. Uh, if you want to change, you can. You know, it's. Yeah. Our life is our own to control. So ignore the naysayers and just, just do it. Yeah, that's so true. And it reminds me, Nikki, when we had the Jabali Network on and yep. they were talking, weren't they, about um, progressing in their career and how they felt that somebody needs to sort of give them that tap on the shoulder and the importance of, you know, somebody actually doing that, kind of recognising talent and mm. kind of encouraging you into a career or, you know, to advance your career. So it's interesting, similar conversation, isn't it? Well, that's what I do now is... Uh... So I'm a massive advocate for apprentices and direct access mm. to nursing. So I work with some absolutely amazing sport workers and I will tell them, yep. like, you really need to go and do your nursing. Because, you know, yeah, it's good. It's fantastic. And they're like, no, no. I was like, you really are. You know? And I think we need to do that. I think we need to build each other up. Yep. If I see mm. someone doing a really good job, mm. tell them. Yeah, because that might yeah. be a positive comment. They might be like, that's, you know, I'm not, they might be questioning themselves, am I good at my job? Tell them. If you tell them, tell them. Just, yeah. you know, big them up because then we're going to get more fantastic, dedicated, caring professionals entering into nursing. Okay. And, yeah. yeah, I think it's our job, especially now I feel it's my job as a nurse, as a registered professional, to just advocate, like, come and join us. You know, you'll make a fantastic nurse and also upskilling staff. So, yeah. I'll sit and I will help train healthcare support workers, mm. uh, pre-reg students who are uh, going the three-year direct university route. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think I won ambassador of the year and mentor last year on the Apprentice Awards for actually helping. And I absolutely love that because mm. I'm so passionate about doing it and uh, that recognition for sport and that. And it just affirmed my belief that we all need good mentors in our life and in our career. Mm. And we can be that mentor. Yeah, we're never too busy to show someone or talk to someone about. Great. Um, I think it's probably important to point out as well, which I probably should have done um, before. Uh, so the um, so the apprenticeship route. Yep. Um, so that's when um, that's when learners are employed by um, a local NHS trust. Mm. Um, so they are essentially funded um, to do their nurse training um, to do either the nursing associate or the registered nurse degree um, apprenticeship. Yep. Um, so students like Stephen. Um, so they are they are paid um, by the trust. Um, they work um, three day, uh, four days. Yeah, <laughs> reducing your hours there. Oh, uh, well, so so four four days. Um, they they're working as either band fours um, or support workers, um, and then one day a week they come into university um, and and get their their education and their um, and their, their training that way um so they're so they're paid throughout um so it breaks down those barriers of yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas whereas in contrast the the direct direct entry students so they do a three-year program uh which is which is full-time um mm. and there's uh tuition fees associated with that as well um mm. and obviously all the, the complications um of um of being a, a full-time student yeah. um so um so that's that's kind of the difference between um the direct entry students and the um and the apprenticeship students yeah it's tweeting that i love the diversity though as well i love the fact that like my daughter my daughter qualified uh, she went to ed show the traditional routes and i love the fact that there's so many different pathways into so that actually we can choose which one suits us because for me yeah. uh, with a mortgage and other commitments uh, i'm gonna get paid for going to university i'll do that route mm. well so my daughter she she's no commitments uh, she has now uh but to actually go the direct route she adored juni she lived in halls she had that full experience and she's a fantastic nurse mm. uh, 
And I think it is brilliant that there is that two different routes ultimately yeah, yeah. the same same end goal, isn't it? And you know, my daughter's like really smart and like yeah. She's she's a really good nurse and she learned so much at uni. Mm. Uh, herself, uh, I've learned a lot of Jane especially, which she's made and she mentioned me and I don't know how all of us asked, but hey, Jane Jane's the reason. Uh <laughs> but absolutely supportive. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, sorry, uh, I'm digressed. But yeah, so there's a real diversity in terms yeah. of the apprenticeship students. That's what we mean, so it? yeah. Stephen's Absolutely. cohort. Um, I think I think the the oldest student that we've had through. Um, she is. Has she turned sixty now? Or she's fifty. Yeah, yeah, sixty. Yeah, yeah, 60. either fifty nine or sixty, and she's just yeah. as bad as a yeah. as a registered mental health yeah. nurse. You know, and absolute, you know, hands up to her, uh, you know, for, for coming back to university, learning all those academic skills, mm. uh, you know, after all that time, you know, mm. working, um, you know, and without the apprenticeship route, she would not be a band five registered yeah, mental well. health now. Yeah. Um, you know, and I and I could give you the stories, you know, from all of Stephen's cohort and all mm. our or all our other cohorts um but it just absolutely opens up you know that that opportunity um, mm -hmm. you know and as i said at the beginning i genuinely feel like mental health nursing you know would not be what it is without the um mm. apprenticeship students mm. oh definitely definitely i think there's a couple more questions are you tweeting vanessa or do you want me to ask them um, no, you can be asking them. I'm just tweeting at the minute. <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. So I'm uh, trying to oh. capture it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really rich. Really rich. Um, David's asked a question. So, from not finishing school um, to getting to university, how did you manage to adapt to the learning? What felt different from flourishing at university versus the kind of experience that you had at school, which was uh, less yeah. than adequate by the sounds of it? Not I wasn't getting bullied. That's a that's a yeah. that's a massive thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jane wasn't like flushing my head down the toilet, but no, I'm serious now. Uh, I think just having that, ex that experience, uh, having peers my own age around me, and we're all there for the same goal. We're all there mm. to learn and support each other. So mm. I think I failed my first assignment on the TNA. Uh, mm. It's like probably looking back now, it's probably the easiest one. Uh, mm. But I wasn't properly, probably academically prepared. Mm. Yeah. I saw the gear, but no idea, so I think I had the shiny pens, but I probably didn't apply myself as much as I should have mm. done. Uh, and I think that was quite a sobering thing, getting my result mm. failed. I was like, oh, mm. I'm not going to do this. But then I resubmitted, passed, uh, and I just started just focusing on my writing, focused on actually what they wanted. Because mm. the last time I'd read anything was when I was at school, so I think... Mm. 15 year old, 14 year old writing is a lot different to what they're expecting in university. And I think that's where college comes in. A lot of people leave school, go to college, which they write to that next level there. Whereas myself, I've You've been making that big but, jump. Yeah, I've just been mm. writing receipts from a red shop and, you know, the odd sports review. But uh, mm. to go there, that step up was quite difficult. Uh, but then, you know, there's loads of like, there's Wiser who will read bound your words, your assignments. Uh, there's also peer support groups that you can see to be to tutor about how they want things to be laid out. Mm. And I just think, again, having that help, uh, mm. that guidance. Mm. And then each assignment becomes that little bit easier because you read the feedback on it and it's like just fine tuning it then. So you tutor mm. with, like, you know, perhaps write this in third person. So you do your next one in third person, they get slightly higher grades. And then I've just continued like that all the way through. Yeah. Uh, so that's my. Think... I think I always say to students as well, because this is another thing that I'm passionate about. I always say to students, like if like academic writing and academia, it's a skill. Um, and if you've never been taught how to reference, yes. if you've never been taught how to um, how to write a reflection or write an academic assignment, um, you, then you, you're not going to know how to do it. Um, you know, and I think with the with the right kind of interventions, with the right kind of teaching, um, you know, and actually sitting down and say, okay, this is how you reference, you know, mm. this is how, you know, this is where this is kind of, you know, just not, just not quite right. And it's a skill and, you yeah. know, and especially, you know, people like Stephen who've had kind of, you know, those gaps in education, 
and not necessarily come straight from college into university. Mm-hmm. You know, they, you, you don't know how to reference. You don't know how to do a reflection. You know, yeah. you don't know how to do it in, in, per, in yeah. third person. You know, it's yeah. it, it's a skill, um, you know, and, and that is something else that I'm, you know, passionate about that, you know, people who have been told, you know, are not done well at school or not flourished at school, you know, that to me, that's no indication of how they may do at, at university. 100%. And it's really easy to get locked in the past. I think something that yeah. Stephen was saying about that belief about what you're capable of and who you are can be set really early yeah. before you finish yeah. and becoming who you are. Yeah, but people yeah. who don't really know you that well and certainly yeah. don't know who you are at 30. Mm. And, and, and a lot of students like Stephen and, and others are, are absolutely amazing, like academically. Yeah. You know, like got you know, mm-hmm. adults like seventy plus. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and so you know, for me, you know, leaving school early or not doing well in GCSEs or not doing well at, at A levels or the equivalent now, mm-hmm. um, you know, for me that that doesn't that you know that doesn't have influence on how someone can do you know at um, at degree level um, or at an apprenticeship. And uh, also, when you're an adult, you just learn differently. Yeah. There's a big difference, isn't there, between being in child prison or school and actually choosing to go somewhere to learn about something that really interests you with a yeah. brain yeah. and ability yeah. to concentrate and focus that you might not have had when you were younger and those skills might not have been there. Mm-hmm. As an adult learner, I think yeah. as an adult learner, it, yeah. you do learn differently. So most so. of the things I learned was on placement and indeed at university for assignments, the academia mm-hmm. side. Well, I have learned so much on the wards because as a TNA slash RNDA, I think I've worked across 12 different wards. Mm. And each ward has given me, I've either had a really amazing mentor on probably every ward I've been on. Yeah. I've been very fortunate in that. And the knowledge I've picked up off there, and mm. that's helped me like this time. That's helped me formulate case studies and do reflections when things haven't gone wrong on the ward. Mm. And I think that is one of the huge benefits of having this apprenticeship is because we are on we're working 30 hours a week, every single week on the wards, uh, sometimes in numbers, sometimes as a student, and yeah. that's super in status. I think we get a, a lot out of that with regards to just improving our skill set. So mm. I think when I qualified a couple of weeks ago as a band five, I've actually been a band four on the register for two years. Yeah. So I feel I'm hitting the ground running sort of thing. And I feel that, again, is one of the benefits of the apprenticeship is being mm. able to... I'm still nervous about things, but it's that the band four is there to sort of bridge that gap between the three and five. So I've sort of yeah. seamlessly flipped over that gap onto band yeah. five and I'm taking more of that leadership role. To, like I was interviewing today, I was interviewing a, a sport workers, which you know, they told me that four years ago that I'd be on the other side of the table yeah. when I first worked in. I'd have been like, nope. Uh, yeah. yeah, we all learn different ways, don't we? And we all learn at our own pace as well mm-hmm. i think having that support around at uni uh tutors like jane as well mm-hmm. as your peers then mm-hmm. you can achieve anything it's yeah it's a good thing so we talked a lot about the kind of benefits but just to make sure we've covered all the bases that we wanted to talk about what about the kind of challenges of either being an apprentice or being on the apprenticeship route in terms of mm-hmm. you know equal opportunities and all those sorts of things yeah, jane what so do you think there's a lot of challenges uh yeah. one of them is so as a Pre-reg student, you are supernumerary. You can't be used for stacking shortfalls. You can't be used for escorts and things because your supernumerary status has to be upheld for insurance purposes. Whereas I think as a trainee, as an apprentice who is employed by the trust, sometimes due to staffing pressures, so your supernumerary status will perhaps be moved to a different day. So you'll come in and you think, yes, I'm going to go into meetings today. I'm going to... Yeah. You know, learn, learn things but then you're a bit short staff so you'll get used in numbers which it happens uh, and that it can be quite disappointing and challenging but then mm. it's massively improved certainly I think at the start of the course because no one knew what the trainee nurse and associate was it was like oh yeah this, are these support workers are they students and there was yeah. very little understanding but I think now it's massively improved and people are getting that time to learn. Mm, mm. The hardest thing as well is doing a long day and then you've got a 2,000 word assignment due the next day and you've not started it. So you do a 13 hour shift, come back and be like, oops. So you just uh, do that. I need to be more prepared. I never am. <laughs> I did my <laughs> dissertation no like three months before and I got, I think I got 80 something percent uh, uh-huh. on the version part one. 
uh, so yeah, I was really pleased with that. And I did that early. And I got a high grade. So that's the thing. Then we go back to university. Yeah. They've looked at me till day before. And I'm going to actually focus. And uh, yeah. <laughs> that's and it out. works differently for everybody. Don't give it that does. advice out widely. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard because we don't get blocked university weeks like the yeah. Reg. Yeah. Uh, you don't get that division. A lot yeah. they can probably do the assignments then because they're at uni, they've got a library, they can study, yeah. and they have a lot of placements where they don't have to perhaps worry as much about assignments. Mm. Whereas with us, it's just constantly, and then also we've got to do the trust training as well because we're employees. We've got days where we've got to go and do our ELS, where we've got yep. to go and do all the other extra bits, part of being an employee. Then we've got to take annual leave when uni's off, which is like really grim time to take annual leaves in winter and March. It's like, I want summer holidays. Uh, but, yeah, it's it can be really challenging. And just getting your voice heard as well as an apprentice. Uh, and it's the same for the student because you may have some placements. Indeed, I've had a couple mm. where perhaps due to people not really, not liking, people who've maybe been qualified for a bit too long, they don't remember when they were students and what support we need. So you just sort of, Mm. You get labelled as the student, which I don't like that. It's like, I have a name, Stephen, the student. Mm. Um, but I think just being recognised and just people taking to one side and teaching you their skills, because we are we are the fountain of knowledge, all of us. Mm. We, if we don't cascade things down, we're going to have a new generation of nurses coming through who don't know how to take a bed, don't know how to write a care plan. Mm. Because we're the ones that teach them that. We don't get taught that university, about mm. how to write a care plan. You get teaching about risk assessments, but unless we the applying of it is is really something that's very specific to different trusts and yeah 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 but we teach on the wards and yeah. it's cultural knowledge being passed on it, one of the things I liked about nursing so much yeah if we don't mm. do that then there's going to be a generation of nurses coming through mm. who are not going to know how to do it and that's mm. going to impact on patients yeah. and I just think. Because you can read all the textbooks in the world, but unless you've got someone like my biggest mentor was a she was a band four assistant practitioner. Mm. She's been there just about thirty years, and mm. she's the sole reason why I did the top up and wanted to work on the ward that I'm on now. Because she's just amazing. Like Paula, thank you, you're a godsend. Uh, mm. She is the fountain of all knowledge. You know, wants to know anything, that's it. And she has so much time to actually sit you down. And go through things with yeah. you. And she's kind, she's compassionate, she's caring. She shares yeah. knowledge freely because she said we're all learners once. And I think we need yeah. more people in the world. We need more people to actually impart that knowledge and not say, sorry, I'm too busy because we do get busy. But let someone, I always say to the students when I have them, you can be my shadow today. Just yeah. follow me. And I'll talk in my head when I'm doing something. I'm, I'll talk out loud so then they know what I'm thinking and what I'm doing. Yeah. You don't have to actively sit down at a classroom and say I'm going to teach you how to do this do it when they're with you mm. uh, if they're receptive to it which a lot of students are they want to learn then you know they'll pick it up and yeah, yeah. fantastic that, that is one of the benefits of the apprenticeship route as well is that mm. you know that the, the students they are in practice kind of four days a week um mm. you know and, and they bring the whole kind of wealth of experience and knowledge mm. uh you know that they've you know that they've that, that, that they've gained from practice as well and I think that's another uh, it's definitely another real uh, mm. real benefit. Mm. I was just looking at so we've 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 nearly finished up our time already. But before we go, there's a couple of things I'd just like to explore a little bit further. So, Jane, I wonder if I could ask you, you know, what do you see as the future of apprenticeships? Where's where's this? Where's it going? I, I don't think apprenticeships is going anywhere. Um, I think it's gonna it's gonna rise and it's gonna and it's gonna grow and it's gonna uh, and and it's gonna build. Um, I think yeah. the you know and um, particularly um, the trust that Stephen works for and that we partnership with uh, Lancashire and South Cumbria uh, Mental Health Trust. Uh, you know they're they're really committed as well to developing their own um, mm. workforce. Um, so it's not going anywhere. Um, and it's going to get it's it's going to grow, um, you know. So we we need to you know as educators as nurses in practice, uh, you know we need to embrace <laughs> the apprenticeship learners, um, you know because they do bring such a um, such a wealth of in, of, of experience, um, you know, um, to the role, um, you know that they're you know it's they're definitely not going anywhere, um, you know. 
and the benefits that they, you know, you know, that they, they, you know, so the trust is, you know, is invested in Stephen and now Stephen's working at the trust as a, you know, as a band five, uh, mm. you know, and I'm sure his career will, you know, will progress kind of within, uh, mm. within the trust as well. Mm. All right. So as we're sort of finishing up now, it'd be good to have like one last thing. Now, if you want to give across one sort of like last key message or something like that. So we'll come to Steve and then Jane and, and Vanessa. Steve. Is there anything that you wanted to, to say? Yeah. So there's a lot of people out there who doubt themselves. I've worked with some, I've met some, you doubt yourself that you're not good enough, that you can't do that, that you're too old. And that's my biggest thing. I'm too old. So it doesn't matter whether you're 50, whether you're 57. If you're doing a three-year university course at 57, you'd be qualified by 60. You will have a good 10 years in a career that you are passionate about. And actually, whether it's social work, whether it's teaching, whether it's nursing, You've got that time to make a difference. Don't get to your retirement age and think, oh, I wish I'd have done this. I wish I'd done this because life's for taking chances. And would you rather stay in a job that makes you deeply unhappy that is just not mundane, but just that you don't really feel a passion for, that you don't get excited to get dressed in the morning and put your uniform on or put your badge on and go, ah, this is me. If you don't feel that in your job, then you're in the wrong job because yeah. get a job that you're excited about that, you just buzz off and you're not you're tired when you get home, but you're not like, oh God, I hate my job, I've got to do it again tomorrow. Get one where you think, can't wait to come back tomorrow. So just just find something like that that mm. gives you purpose some career. You're never too old. Whether you go the university route, whether you go the apprenticeship route by yourself, just, mm. just do it because you'll make a difference to people's lives and you'll make a difference to your own life and your family. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Jane? Uh, I echo some of what Stephen said it's never too late you're never too old um you're never too uneducated either um you know if you've got the passion and the drive then I can teach you to do referencing <laughs> you to write an academic assignment um you know don't don't let that you know that fear um hold people back um and I think you know, I've been on, on here before and talked about my own kind of personal experiences as a mental health service user as well. Um, you know, mm-hmm. so from my mental health service, uh, service user, you know, perspective, yeah. um, you know, the the apprenticeships just give me, they, they, give, they give me hope for the future um, of mental health nursing. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, that, that, that pretty much sums it up. We get some incredibly um gifted um special uh really dedicated compassionate um nurses through um through the apprenticeship route um mm. and from my perspective as a mental health service user uh you know i i i want these guys in the profession uh you know i want them as um as registered mental health nurses definitely uh, vanessa yeah, I think just to echo what everyone's already said, I think just listening to Stephen's story, I think it's really inspiring and people who are listening hopefully will feel inspired because I think as much as you can advertise and encourage people into apprenticeships, I think listening to somebody who's been on that journey is what will inspire people and we've talked, haven't we, a lot about um, the sort of imposter syndrome that people experience and I just think Stephen sharing his story, it's just really important, isn't it? And yeah, it's been a real pleasure having you on tonight, I think. And hopefully people listening will feel inspired to follow the same journey as you as well. So thank you. Yeah. It's been just, lovely. just one more thing. If anybody is interested in 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 pursuing the apprenticeship route, um, you know, then 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 look um on NHS jobs, um, the the band four roles um and the registered nurse degree apprenticeship uh, programs that different trusts offer. Um, are often open to external um, candidates as well. Um, they're not always just open to existing um, existing members of staff. So we had students on the um, on the two year program um, that had worked in um, in adult services or come from other trusts or, or other areas, um, and they were employed as an apprenticeship. Um, so so yeah, just just go for it. And if you if you look on L- LSCFT uh, jobs, uh, you can actually get a friendship, and you can have me as your mentor. So <laughs> yes, your personal team. Absolutely, James. Yeah. <laughs> your mentor, dream team. 
No, Let's it see. started off as a general message that was making me feel fuzzy, and it ended up as a quite specific advert. But I, I still love it as a message. So, <laughs> thank you very much to everybody uh, for being guests tonight. It's been just such a pleasure to be able to talk about something so celebratory. You know, really, really happy, happy experience. Next week, um, we have a fantastic researcher coming on, Shannon Murray, who's going to be talking about um, sort of the work around researching and supporting people from stigmatised backgrounds, particularly people who are using substances who are LGBTQ+, which is an often overlooked group. So it's going to be a really interesting discussion next week, and we hope to have you with us again. So thank you very much for watching, and again, thank you to our lovely guests. Good night, all. Thank you. Night. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.